I've chosen to title our final session, Becoming Human. From selfishness to selflessness, favoring cooperation over competition. In our six-part series, Getting to Know Our Interreligious Partners, we've explored the four most influential world religions today. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. We've learned that though each religious tradition has and continues to undergo a unique historical evolution, no tradition develops in a vacuum immune from the influence of other traditions. We surveyed the key concepts that characterize each tradition, uh, for example, karma, the five pillars, Brahman, Torah, yoga, and added to this, we deepened our grasp of each tradition by inquiring into the unique problem, solution, and ultimate goal that each tradition identifies, as well as each tradition's view of humanity. When taken together, we discover that all religions aren't the same. They are different in significant and vital ways, and these differences should be honored and explored. And yet, in our final lesson today, we will learn that our religions aren't entirely different either. As we will see, they collectively provide a startlingly hu uh, har harmonious analysis of the human condition and, and what is required of us to become fully and truly human. Indeed, it's our shared view of humanity that should matter more than all of our collective differences combined. Throughout human history, religion has been an essential part of our evolution. In fact, it's been argued that religion is what made us human, guiding us in our struggle to compete with contemporaneous hominid species. It was our particular use of religion that made us the sole surviving species of the genus Homo. Homo sapiens, that's you and me, first evolved in Africa some 200,000 years ago before our eventual worldwide migration. While in Africa, we were forced to endure significant hardships, including a failed first wave attempt to settle outside of Africa in what is known as the Levant. We struggled in Africa, and so moving out of Africa, though of course as early humans, we didn't know we were in Africa. We did move into this area, this region known as the Levant. And as we did, we encountered Homo erectus and Neanderthals. But more importantly, we encountered Neanderthals and that this area was indeed dominated by, uh, by that species of human. So we were there for only a short period of time um, before migrating back into Africa, being pushed back in to our homeland. Still worse, we underwent a thousand year ice age that dramatically altered the climate and caused a sort of population bottleneck. You can see here that as the climate changed uh, in the continent of Africa, it caused the desert region um, of the Sahara to expand and create only a small uh, sort of portion in the middle there in Africa um, that was inhabitable. So as a result, about 70,000 years ago, a result of the, of the Ice Age, um, the population rate eventually dwindled to as few as 2,000 mating pairs, the closest that we have ever come to extinction. The immense and particular survival pressures of isolation heavily influenced our evolution in Africa and caused a significant and rapid leap forward in our humanity. You see, at first, as I said, we did not do so well in this sort of population bottleneck um, as, as our population um, struggled to, um, to find a way to cope and to adapt with this, this new setting. Um, and I think the story that, that sort of makes sense to me is that um, in, this, in this first initial um, 
period of, of, of what I'm calling sort of the, the bottleneck um, period, we, we do very little to cooperate, to collaborate as, um, as communities, and as a result, we suffer. And as I said, my, we ultimately dwindle to as few as, as 2,000 migrating uh, mating pairs. Um, so something interesting happens in the geological record here. We know, we know how small human, our human population gets at this point, but we also notice that there is a, um, there's a rapid explosion in population uh, during this time, just after um, our, we get to our, 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 our lowest rate. And, and th this population growth it has to be um, um, corollary or, or correlated to our ability, of course, to learn how to adapt or how to cope with this particular bottleneck scenario, wherein, you know, it's almost as though we get down as small as we possibly can and, and um, almost to the extent that, that because we're so small in numbers, um, the eventual repopulation of our, of our population, it, it's almost a family effort, if you will. Indeed, um, we have genetic ties to everyone who, who was in this bottleneck uh, time period. All of us do. Um, so in this family effort, we do learn to cooperate. We do learn to collaborate. Perhaps it's because of this, this, uh, this family, the, the, the reality that it was indeed something more like a family effort. So between 50,000 and 80,000 years ago, climate conditions made the second wave, the Great Migration, out of Africa possible. By this time, we had developed advanced religious-based strategies of communal organization and cooperation. And as a result, we become better adapted for survival than any other species in our genus. We quickly spread across the entire globe. And as we migrate, we encountered earlier primitive humans, on rare occasions mixing, but eventually displacing and replacing them. In contrast to our species, other species like Homo erectus, Neanderthals and Denisovians, they failed to develop the same level of religion-based socio-cultural complexity. This is likely because they lacked the key mental and social faculties we were forced to evolve in this sort of bottleneck time. Mental abilities such as, such as recursive thinking, that is, thinking about thinking, uh, being able to, uh, to know that we're, we're, we're thinking. And this is, uh, of course, something like ego awareness. Theory of mind, this is appreciating what someone else is thinking, knowing that we have thoughts and that others have their own thoughts as well, and being able to appreciate that not everyone shares our, our sort of mental imagination or even the, um, the, the, the process or the voice in our mind. It's not shared by everyone. Abstract thought, um, it really needs no d definition. We're, the ability to, to think about things in an abstract way, and even even utilize that, that, that for, um, for, for uh, planning, for thinking ahead. And we develop an inhibition um, of impulse reactions. So we're able to control our, our, our impulses. Added to this, there are key social instincts like kinship selection. That means the ability to, um, to select um, for um, taking care of those who are our genetic relations. So um, recognizing who is a family member and who is not, um, and, um, and, and, and having altruism for those individuals. And of course, this, this was, um, was developed during that, that bottleneck period when sort of we are, we're all family, so we all sort of get along and sort of the, from a gene's eye view, um, you know, that, that um, genetic agenda is very much at work here, wanting to pass on our genes from generation to generation. Um, it's in our best interest to develop this kinship selection, a care for, for those who are our family members. And in the midst of that, we, we develop uh, reciprocal altruism, where we exchange um, doing things for others, knowing that they will return, or, or believing that they will return um, the favor. So sort of a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And linguistic creativity. Um, it takes a lot of creativity uh, and, and, and communicational abilities um, to communicate uh, sort of what we, what we want to do uh, as communities and, um, and particularly when it comes to religion. 
And finally, we have developed empathy. So at the risk of sounding um, reductionistic or oversimplistic, the four living religions that we have explored, including Christianity, making five, though the oldest, though they, they are the oldest enduring traditions today, I want to I want to make sure that we know that they themselves have been the result of a complex evolutionary process. Relig religious traditions have been developing and, and adapting and providing the foundation for still more traditions for practically as long as Homo sapiens, that's us, have walked the earth. Indeed, when taken together, the world's living religions contain and preserve the distilled wisdom of the human species. By the way, our genus, Homo sapiens, it means wise ones in Latin. And indeed, at the root core of each religious tradition that we wise ones inhabit today, we find a common wisdom, a wisdom that is expounded upon time and time again. A wisdom that represents a leap forward in the ongoing evolution of humanity. A wisdom that, when practiced, has led to new experiences and expressions of being connected to one monadic ultimate, the, the eternal divine reality that we all describe and, and seek, something that we may even call God. The variety of human experiences of this reality, though uniquely expressed through the vehicle of each religion, practically from the beginning, led to a universal impulse to improve on the human condition by raising the bar on what it means to be fully and truly a human being. I'm going to walk us through a, a little exercise here. Um, I wonder if you can guess which religious tradition um, that each of these descriptions belongs to. So you'll recall that um, as I said, we uh, characterized each of these traditions asking what the unique problem, solution, um, the goal uh, of each of these traditions is. And then also, in our, final, in our final look of each tradition, we asked what each tradition says about humanity. So I've taken those descriptions of what each tradition says about humanity, and I've removed um, anything or most of, of, the, of the language from that particular tradition that would, that would give you... Um, an idea that that was the, the, the tradition that we're talking about here, so that we can see just how related these traditions are when it comes to humanity. And I, I, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna roll through these here really quick. In our first one here, it says, "Humans are created in the image of ultimate divine reality, a reality that lives in us all. We become fully human when we have mastered the balance between the divine self and the primal ego self." I wonder if this sounds to you like it's Judaism, because it is. Our next one says, to become fully human is to actualize one's essential divine self. Becoming one with ultimate divine reality, we no longer operate from the ignorance of the primal ego self. Would you guess that this is? Hinduism? Humans must struggle to subdue the primal ego self, which is responsible for prideful self-centeredness and a denial of ultimate divine reality's love for everyone, the worst form of idolatry. We become fully human when we submit to the will of ultimate divine reality. Uh, there's a bit of a hint here, and it is the word submit. <laughs> this is Islam. Humans are created in the image of ultimate divine reality, with the divine self built in. But we also develop a primal ego self, and so must choose between selfishness and selflessness. We become fully human when we choose to deny our ego self in loving service to others. This is Christianity. And the final one, to become fully human, we must cultivate mindfulness and become selfless. 
By nature, we over-identify with the primal ego self, ignorantly clinging to notions of permanence in an impermanent world. When we become fully awake to the way of ultimate divine reality, we are freed to compassionately work for the well-being of others. Of course, this is Buddhism. This is the end of part one. Um, I have broken them up into two parts so that they are easier to download, of course, um, and also uh, for your viewing convenience. So please um, tune in to the second part um, as we conclude our final session of getting to know our interfaith partners.